Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you are joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU's special webinar on sustainability in conjunction with 2021 Annual International Business Ethics and Sustainability Case Competition. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management at the College of Business Administration of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. Also the director of the Center for International Business Education, often called CYBE or CYBER using the acronym. Today's program is co-sponsored by LMU Center for International Business Education, Institute for Business Ethics and Sustainability, often abbreviated as IBES, and LMU's graduate chapter of Net Impact. You will hear more about IBES and Net Impact later. Let me just briefly introduce LMU side. LMU is one of the 15 universities in the country that has received the prestigious cyber grants from the US Department of Education in 2018. The LMU side serves as regional as well as national resources for students, faculty, and business community through international business education, foreign language training, and research capacities. As part of our mission to help improve global competitiveness of the U.S. businesses, LMU Cyber has been offering a conference or a webinar on various topics of international business, such as global supply chain, innovative global marketing, and global talent management. In particular, two years ago, LMU Cyber organized its first Global Sustainability Summit to discuss the UN's United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and how business and academia can work together to be innovative leaders in the field of sustainability. Today, we are very glad to sponsor another webinar on sustainability with a special focus on the growing impact of climate risk on investment risk and the global financial system. Today's event is being hosted and moderated by the leadership team of LMU's graduate chapter of Net Impact. And now I'd like to turn it over to Ava Jose Brie. So Ava. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, thank you for joining. First and foremost, I wanted to give a special thanks to all of our panelists for putting the time uh, to join and educate us. My name is uh, Ava Orava, and I'm part of the leadership team of LMU's Net Impact chapter, alongside with Mara, Alex, Lauren, and Ernesto. I wanted to let you know a little bit about our chapter and our vision. Um, LMU Net Impact's goal is to inspire and empower people to make a positive impact on the world by using business as a force for good. Our mission is to inspire, equip, and activate emerging leaders such as yourselves, uh, with the understanding and skill set needed to lead in the 21st century, taking into account the sustainable development goals. I think you will find this event extremely informative given our panelist lineup. Alex from Net Impact will be introducing and chatting with Alexandra Hirsch from BlackRock, uh, getting into what Net Zero is and its importance, as I'm sure many of you have been hearing more about in the business news. Then Mara from Net Impact will be talking with Isabella Tadaro and Caitlin Drown from Climate Neutral about how they're helping businesses measure and work towards achieving um, zero net carbon. And she will also be talking with Bree Decker from Avocado Green, a B-certified corporation, uh, which they will talk more about what that is. This is a great opportunity for you to ask uh, any questions you may have about sustainable investment and net zero. You can ask your questions in the Q&A box uh, where you actually have the option to upvote um, a question that somebody el else asked so that we can make sure everybody's question is being answered. And Lauren and Ernesto will keep an eye out for that. I will now go ahead and pass it on to Alex to introduce our first panelist. Thank you so much, Ava. Welcome everyone. We are so excited to have you all participating in this event. I have the immense pleasure of introducing our first guest speaker, Alexandra Hirsch. Alexandra drives platform strategy and product innovation in the Americas for the BlackRock Sustainable Investment Team. 
BlackRock's the world's largest asset manager with nearly 9 trillion assets under management. And they operate globally uh, with 70 offices in 30 countries with clients in over 100 countries. Alexander's team is focused on identifying drivers of long-term return associated with environmental, social, and government's issues and integrating these issues throughout BlackRock's investment process. Welcome, Alexandra. Um, we're so excited to learn more about BlackRock's sustainability initiatives. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to, uh, to chat with you. So I wanted to start off by asking about this, a certain annual tradition um, of BlackRock CEO, Larry Fink, where he publishes this letter to investors and business leaders calling for action on different issues important to him, such as corporate governments or climate change. I thought it was really interesting that in his last letter, the 2021 letter, he stresses the importance of transitioning to a net zero economy. So could you kind of tell us more about uh, Mr. Fink's letter? What exactly is net zero and what does this all mean for companies and investors? Yeah, so so great question. Um, so as you mentioned, Larry Fink has been writing these letters annually for a number of years. And starting in 2020, there was a big focus on sustainability. So um, in 2020, we came out saying that climate risk was investment risk and that sustainability was our new standard for investing and that portfolios that are sustainably oriented are will provide better, more resilient performance for investors. And in 2020, as you noted, there was a big focus on net zero. Um, and what is net zero? <laughs> so net zero is... Um, an economy that emits no more carbon dioxide than we remove from the atmosphere. So today, carbon capture technology is um, is not really there yet. But um, in in the future, what it means is that we're not emitting any more emissions into the atmosphere. And so the goal there is supportive of the 2015 Paris Agreements, where a number of governments across the globe came together in order to agree to limit global warming to one and a half to two degrees above pre-industrial levels. And um, science has shown us that if we agreed, if we kind of meet that goal, that we'll limit the most negative impacts of climate change. And so in meeting net zero, we have 127 governments representing over 60% of global emissions. We also have over 1,200 companies that have committed to net zero by 2050. And so what this means as an entire economy is that we're going to need to just transition and transform our businesses um, and our economies in order to meet this global goal, um, in order to make sure we all have a planet um, for ourselves and for our children and next generations to live on. Super interesting. I'm so curious about what you say, the phrase uh, climate risk equals in investment risk. And the, like, why is this so important to BlackRock? And practically, like, what does that exactly mean? Why, why is it risky to, or not risky, uh, to care about climate? Yeah, so, so climate, um, you know, a lot of what spurred Larry's letters over the past two years has been more and more conversations with clients where climate and sustainability are top of mind. And so wanting to really make sure that we're addressing what clients are thinking. But as far as climate risk being investment risk, I think that we've seen more and more that the negative implications of climate are really impacting portfolios and just our general lives. Um, so when you think about wildfires in California, um, in Australia, hurricanes, um, storms in Texas, you know, I think that uh, the physical risks of climate change are having a real impact on portfolios. In 2020 alone, there was over $200 billion of damages related to climate disasters, um, which was the most on record. And we've continued to see increases in that number over the past 20 years. And so wanting to make sure that investors are aware not only of the physical risks, like what's going to happen due to hurricanes, but um, now also like the transition risks. So as we transition to a net zero economy, what are the risks to businesses that are not adapting, um, that are putting their head in the sand, that are not moving to where the puck is going? Um, there's a risk there as well that their business model will no longer be useful in the future. Yeah. And so, so uh, yeah. So it's, yeah, it just sounds like this long-term mindset is building companies that are more adaptable and more resilient and therefore better for long, uh, for better returns for investors. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, making sure that companies are evaluating their climate risk um, and their transition risk. And so what we're asking companies, so last year um, there was a big focus on our stewardship team. And basically what they do is um, BlackRock is one of the largest owners of almost every public company because we're such a large company. And so what we do from a stewardship perspective, those are 40 people globally that are engaging with companies on a daily basis on material ESG issues. And so last year, one of the big things we asked was for more data and more transparency. So um, more reporting against SASB, the um, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, um, which identifies what are material um, metrics to report on based off of each industry. Because what's interesting, what's important for one industry is very different you know, for a restaurant versus an energy company. Um, and to report against TCFD, which is the Task Force for Climate Related Disclosure. And that forces a company to identify what are their climate risks. What we're asking today is that companies create a plan for how they're going to meet net zero. Um, so it's 30 years away, but it's going to be a significant transition of our economy. So what we're requesting today is that companies take a step back and kind of figure out like, what are our long-term plans and what are our kind of like short and medium term plans in order to get there? Um, and that companies that are not disclosing and reporting plans, to us that means that they're, they're putting their head in the sand and they're not really working to transition their business. And so as a result, are at significant risk um, as we transition to net zero. Super interesting. So I'm curious, um, have you seen ESG, and for anyone who uh, doesn't know the abbreviation Environmental Social Governance, align portfolios, um, how they're performing in comparison to non-ESG peers? I understand there might not be a ton of historical data, so this is fairly new, but I'm curious if you see a, a trend um, there. Yeah, so that's a great question. I think um, sustainable funds got a bit of a bad rap over the past like decade or so, because where we saw sustainable funds was really focused on divestment. So um, screening certain industries from the portfolio. What we're seeing today is a more dynamic approach where people are evaluating ESG metrics. So as opposed to eliminating all of your energy exposure, you're focused on identifying what are the companies that are going to be a part of the transition? Like who's investing in clean tech? Who is committed to developing electric vehicles to identify what companies are going to be best from a performance perspective? Um, and so what we've expected is that sustainable strategies will deliver resilience. So over the long term, you're going to expect similar risk adjusted returns. Maybe it'll lag a little bit on the on the upside, but on the downside, you're expecting a little bit of a cushion. And we saw that play out in 2020. So in the first quarter of 2020, as you remember, the market um, had a significant downdraft. And we saw that 94% um, of sustainable indices outperformed their traditional peers. And then when you look at the entire year of 2020, we saw that over 80% of sustainable indices outperform their peers. Um, Morningstar's also done a lot of work to look um, and compare funds and has seen that sustainable strategies over one, two, three, five, and 10 years have mm -hmm. delivered strong performance against traditional strategies. Yeah, so I'm seeing, it's super interesting because uh, well, now we're seeing the performance actually come in, but it, it really mentioned divestment and really, I think it's important to understand that before kind of sustainable investing was divestment, or we kind of looked at ESGs as these like insight um, to management effectiveness and kind of used as a signal of operational excellence for companies. And, but now ESGs and net zeros are like essential initiatives um, and it's prompting this really fundamental reshaping of finance. And I think you mentioned it a little bit in clients coming to you, but could you speak more on what's prompting this shift? Like where are the, is this change coming from? Companies yeah. or investors? For sure. So we think that there's two drivers of sustainability. Uh, one is more fundamental and one's more technical. So from a fundamental standpoint, we're seeing, I think maybe if you turn it the term ESG integration, which basically means that traditional strategies are integrating and evaluating environmental, social, and governance risks and opportunities during their traditional investment process. So you're starting to see more of these metrics get priced into asset prices. Second, you're seeing a lot better, more data. Um, data still has a far way to go, 
but um, there's a few things that are driving data, right? One is more and more company disclosure. So the number of companies that are reporting sustainability care, um, metrics have increased significantly over the past 10 years. Um, further, um, SASB I mentioned earlier, we saw over a 360% increase in the number of companies that are reporting against SASB. So investors just have more data to evaluate in order to make these decisions and integrate it into their portfolios. Um, you also have a number of third-party rating agencies, um, which are allowing investors to like get like bite-size evaluation of ESG. Um, and then you also have machine learning and like and um, data like that. So, for instance, some interesting stuff we're doing is um, using Glassdoor. So you you might know know the website. Um, it's a good place to go to see where you're interviewing. What are people saying about it? Um, what we found is that the CEO approval rating is actually really helpful for us understanding how a company is going to perform because if it has a low approval rating, that means that you're gonna have significant turnover of your employees. Um, hiring, training new employees is um, incredibly costly to a business. And so a business that treats their employees well, that has long-term retention of employees is actually better positioned. So it's an interesting kind of like social factor to evaluate when you're trying to understand companies. Um, so, the data is better. Um, more and more people are pricing this into markets. Um, and we think that these are going to continue to, from like a technical factor standpoint, continue to impact um, flows in the future. So in 2020, we saw over $288 billion flow into sustainable strategies, um, which was a 90% increase over 2019. And we expect this kind of technical flow into sustainability to increase um, because you're seeing, you're seeing the performances there, you're seeing that there's better data, um, and you're seeing also trends from a number of different investors that are focused on wanting to align more of their capital with, um, with their values. Interesting. I mean, that sounds like a huge amount of data that we're able to that we're working on being able to access and organize. And I'm curious if you could speak to, um, and maybe this is part of what your sustainable investing team, um, how they help uh, companies, investors. But what tools and resources are needed to kind of work within that? And I'm also curious of a global standardization of using this data. I know you mentioned a couple organizations that seem to be the standard, um, but I'd be interested in learning more about how we're capturing this and what standards and how we'll work together for kind of making a global standard here. Yeah, so um, Europe recent came, recently came out with SFDR, which is their big kind of regulatory framework, which um, has managers um, categorize their funds, um, Article 6, 8, or 9, uh, depending on like the sustainability metrics of those funds, which creates like a very clear rubric for investors and for asset managers to be sure that they're speaking the right language and that things are labeled the right way. Um, we're not there yet in the States. We actually saw today that China signed on to want to leverage what the EU has put together from a taxonomy standpoint. So I expect that we're somewhere behind that. I'm not sure if we're going to sign on to the same metrics they have, but I know this administration is really focused on sustainability and on climate. Um, and I think like a, a taxonomy is really important. Um, so for instance, um, it would be helpful I can kind of talk about how BlackRock like likes to label our funds. Um, so we start with screens, so it's really avoid or advance. So avoiding are your typical kind of screen products. And uh, we've seen a significant amount of interest there um, from Europe, still a little bit of interest in the States as well. Um, but in Europe, you have a lot of that from a regulatory perspective. Um, certain um, investors are forced to not own certain industries or certain types of um, companies. Um, and then you have advance. Um, within the advanced category, you're really using ESG as a tool to drive performance and seek better outcomes. Uh, so there you have ESG, thematic, and impact, um, which is the way we kind of break it out. So ESG broad are strategies that look to have better ESG profiles than the traditional benchmark. They, use, they look to leverage E, S, and G um, alpha signals in order to drive performance, whereas thematic strategies are focused on a specific E, S, or G factor. So we've seen a lot of interest in climate. And so climate um, exposure can be niche. It can be focused on like clean tech or, um, you know, like a, a, a circular economy type um, thematic strategy, or it could be like a broader application. So there are strategies that look to give you exposure to an index with a lower carbon um, 
lower carbon exposure, tilt the portfolio towards companies that are better positioned for the transition. Um, and then a lot of focus as well on like um, DE and I, so diversity and inclusion, women managers um, within the S segment as well. And then, um, then the final one is impact. And impact to us is like a very high bar. All of our impact strategies need to report to the IFC and do reporting that they meet those metrics. Um, and there for impact strategies, that means that every dollar that you invest at the time you invest it, you have a specific KPI, a key performance indicator that you expect from your dollars. Um, so there's a key measurable impact that you want your dollars to make. Um, so within that strategy would be like investing in renewable energy or investing in green bonds, for instance. So I think that, you know, taxonomy is incredibly important. Um, and BlackRock is really focused on making sure that we have like alignment and understanding across asset managers and our clients as well. I'm very curious because I've always thought, so the ESG is the environmental social governance and it seems like it's fairly easier to like capture environmental quantitative data. And for me personally, the S of it has always been a little nebulous. I know you mentioned like Glassdoor and women-led businesses, but how, um, yeah, what are the KPIs related to the S? And I think we're seeing that that's really the hot topic right now with um, the social justice issues. So I'd be curious to hear more about the S of ESG. Yeah, so you hit the nail on the head. I think that there's been a lot of research that has shown certain environmental factors being very financially material. So um, we've done some work at looking at carbon emissions intensity. So you might think that's a really good thing to evaluate an energy company, but what about everyone else? Um, actually, we've done research to understand that uh, companies that are actively reducing their carbon emissions across industries are outperforming companies that are increasing their carbon emissions. It's another way for us to kind of understand a company's operational efficiency. Um, when it comes to S, it is a lot more nebulous. And there is a lot of research being done to better understand what metrics are really driving performance. Um, when we think about um, social or S, or we kind of think about it as like stakeholder research, um, we're trying to understand not only like how are the employees, um, you know, from an education standpoint, like what is a firm doing to reinvest in their employees? Um, not only, you know, how, what, how diverse is the board? Um, Cause that can sometimes be seen as window dressing, but like mm -hmm. how many women managers do you have? What's the rate of change of the number of women managers that you have? And we like to see like a positive momentum there. Um, it's a lot harder to have window dressing on the number of women managers you have than the number of women on your board, even though board diversity is very important. Um, and we're also looking at strategies that are focused on um, providing capital to minority owned or minority focused communities to make sure that historically undercapitalized companies and communities have access to capital. Um, and you can also think about um, that within the mortgage space as well. So making sure you're identifying mortgages that are going to people that are housing insecure, that are from certain socioeconomic um, positions where having a house is their ability to create wealth and like long-term wealth because they're not able to invest in the stock market, for instance. Um, so there's a lot of work being done on S. Definitely keep your eyes peeled on it. Um, it's certainly an exciting space um, and, a, and a huge focus this year as well. Interesting. So uh, this also brings to mind, I mean, like I said, uh, BlackRock is a global company. So it must be even a bigger challenge because what is a big issue across regions and countries and different dynamics is also very challenging. So how does BlackRock deal with this uh, globally, setting these KPIs? So it's really a matter of the specific strategy regarding like what KPIs they're focused on. Um, so I'd say that Europe is a little bit ahead of us on the thematic side um, and uh, the U.S. is like quickly catching up. Um, but um, from a KPI standpoint, it really depends on like what's material to that specific strategy. Um, mm -hmm. I think what's most interesting is when you look at like when you step back and think about it from like a regional perspective, sustainability is just table stakes in EMEA. Um, we did a, um, a uh, survey of uh, 425 different investors representing over $25 trillion in capital. And we saw that on average, um, investors plan to double their allocation to sustainable assets over the next five years. Um, we saw that that stat was higher in, in Europe and a little bit lower in the US, but uh, we still expect to see over a 50% increase in allocations. 
Um, so I think the regional differences are really just um, the focus on sustainability, how mainstream it is so yet. Um, and I think that we're, we're not there yet in the US, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm hopeful that we will get there. In bringing it back to, to net zero, what does like a successful transition to net zero look like? What does that mean for not just uh, for our financial, for our economy, but just kind of like uh, globally, um, what is the outcome? Yeah, I mean, I think globally we've seen, especially with the pandemic when it comes to like vaccines, that it has not been an equitable process regarding who has access to vaccines. Um, globally and in our in our own country. And I think that when you look at climate change, you see a number of the negative um, physical risks are really negatively impacting um, communities that um, have less ability to kind of pick up and move, have less um, financial capital to support themselves. And so what's important about reaching net zero is that we need to do it as a globe, and we need to make sure it's an equitable, um, equitable process. Uh, a, a strat um, we're working on investing on creating um, a strategy that will invest in renewable energies in the in the emerging markets. Um, so we've historically had a really big practice investing in the developed market and in like the um, existing markets, but not emerging markets. And we've actually partnered with the governments of um, France and Germany, as well as a few um, endowments and foundations to seed this strategy. And now we're seeking institutional capital in order to make sure that we are trying to create a more equitable and just transition to net zero. That's amazing. I'm also really curious about this whole, uh, we're talking about this big overall shift. Um, and could you speak on like the generational, the shift of wealth from generations? Because I do think that we're seeing as um, the millennial generation comes into their wealth that it's also timing up with these shifts. Does that have anything to do with it? Yeah, the, the transfer of wealth is going to be a huge impact in um, in sustainability taking more hold. You know, as I mentioned the survey historically, you know, I think that it's easy to say, oh, it's all millennials, it's all women. I think that it is a lot bigger than that. And I don't want for my statements, my next statements to draw away from that. But we are seeing that millennials are a lot more focused on aligning their investments with their values. Um, we're seeing that with the products that are purchased. So um, millennials are willing to spend more on a sustainable product. Um, second is millennials are evaluating companies. I mentioned Glassdoor, evaluating companies a lot more on what they're doing from an ES and G standpoint when they're thinking about, I don't want to tell you guys, you guys are all you know MBA students, um, when they're thinking about like where they want to go work. So in order for companies to attract the best talent, they need to start thinking about that as well. And so I think that's going to be a feedback loop. Um, but as we see this transfer of wealth to millennials, we expect that that will continue to really push this focus on sustainability, both from a fundamental and a technical standpoint. So the power is in your hands. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you had mentioned this uh, before, but I, I just want to repeat it because it seems so amazing. So from last year in 2020, 20, uh, $288 billion were invested in sustainable assets, which was a 96% increase um, from 2009. So where where do we go from here? What does BlackRock see the, the scaling to and what can we expect to see in the coming years? So uh, our sustainable assets, we currently manage $200 billion of sustainable assets, um, and that excludes um, strategies that are just focused on screens. Um, and our capital in sustainable strategies doubled in 2020. So we went from around 100 billion to 200 billion. Um, in 2020 in the annual, I think in the letter, um, Larry mentioned that we thought that we would get to a trillion dollars of sustainable assets by 2030. So that's our goal, but we also hope that we'll meet that a lot sooner. And so um, there's been a lot of market sizing ideas on like how big is the market going to be and when, and all of those expectations have been dwarfed a lot sooner than, than expected. Um, so hopefully we'll meet a trillion dollars before. And then if you think of us as a segment of the market, um, it'll continue to grow significantly. Yeah. I mean, I think it's more, it's very interesting that it's been exceeding expectations. And I think as we feel, you know, pandemic, climate, like more extreme weather, it's more a need than ever before than a nice to have or an indicator of a strong company. It is truly a need that's driving the shift. Yeah. So it's interesting because, um, you know, I mentioned in 2020, which feels like so long ago now, um, our letter said, you know, sustainability is our standard and we're so focused on sustainability. 
and then the pandemic hit and it's still here, but the pandemic hit and we were worried that like, no one's going to focus on sustainability, right? Like everyone's really focused on like really important issues right now. The sustainability is important, but we thought it would draw attention away. And we actually saw the opposite happen. We saw that in the first quarter, there were significant outflows um, from strategies. We actually saw inflows into sustainable products. Um, we, and then we also saw the sustainable strategies delivered better performance during that period. Um, and, you know, we did a lot of work. I think the easy thing to say and what you read in the papers is that sustainable strategies outperform because they're underweight energy and they're overweight tech, um, technology companies. But um, we have some strategies that are more kind of like industry agnostic versus the traditional benchmark. They're trying to pick the better companies. And we actually saw that those strategies outperformed and it was more related to security selection um, than a specific industry tilt. Um, so interesting stuff. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I think in the last year, um, I, I heard a couple times the idea that resilience is the new competitive advantage. So because we we're seeing like how things can be shaken and we're building more resilient companies. And wow, here's a set of standards with, with ESG, ESG and net uh, zero that is like a pathway to resilience, which I think is super interesting. I wanted to kind of uh, also on a personal note, because we have a lot of students here, ask you about how your career and your path into this for people looking to get into sustainability um, or finance, finance and sustainability. I'm just curious about your path to where you are now at BlackRock. So it took me a long time to get here. Um, so for those that want to make the move, um, it might take time, but I um, first got interested. I was always kind of interested in the environment. Um, in college, I took a class on environmental economics, and I just loved the idea that the free markets could like solve our world's like challenges. Um, after college, I was a trader, and uh, at that point, there was the idea that we would have cap and trade, um, where the government would put a, a cap on like certain number of carbon emissions that you could have, and if you it, were below that, you could essentially like monetize it and sell it to those that wanted to emit more than they were allowed. Um, so I wanted to get into it then. And then the global financial crisis happened, and like gap and trade didn't happen. Um, and then I went to business school and out of business school went into um, investor relations, business development and an asset manager. And from there, real in, focused on credit. So like <laughs> nowhere close to sustainability. Um, but um, then leverage that experience into this role um, in sustainability. So what I'll say is that uh, sometimes it's a windy road, but um, keep your eye on, on what you want. And, and there's a number of different opportunities within the sustainability space um, and asset management space um, between, you know, investors, so like working for large pension fan plans or endowments, um, working for consultants, um, that do a lot of work um, on sustainability or, um, you know, advising investors on like where to allocate and then obviously the asset managers as well. Um, there's a number of, um, you know, data providers that are an interesting space to go. Um, I think sustainability also like if you look at being a sustainability officer at a company. Um, and so I feel like there's a lot of different spaces um, to get into from like a finance sustainability perspective. Yeah, sustainability is everywhere, as I think we are seeing uh, from this conversation. So I see we have a bunch of questions uh, in our Q&A section. I'm going to turn this over to Lauren, who's going to ask some questions from our audience. Great. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, so I'm going to go to the first question here. It's regarding data anal analytics. Um, where do you see data analytics employment opportunities for college graduates in the future in this industry? Um, what types of educational background or professional experience would you say best prepare students to enter those pathways? Um, so I can speak from from like our perspective um, is uh, we I think actually, I don't even think that our team formally recruits because we're worried that we're going to get too many applicants. So instead, we just review everyone else's applicants and then like say like, oh, hey, do you want to come um, interview with us? Um, and what I'd say is um, 
I mean, I'm a liberal arts major, so I think, um, you know, whatever your background is, I think that it's important to show like being very thoughtful, very um, focused on like grades and doing well, but also showing that your commitment to sustainability. Um, so I think being a part of net impact, um, doing as much as you can from an extracurriculars or like um, internship perspective to show your commitment um, to kind of stand out from the crowd. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the next question. How critical is the regulatory environment in driving net zero? Yeah, I mean, I think um, we need regulation. I, I think, um, you know, uh, what's challenging for companies is that depending on the administration, like I think the, the pendulum swings pretty far in either direction when it comes to climate and sustainability. Um, so I think that, you know, having regulation be something where um, companies have like a long term target where they can like commit to goals to move forward towards um, is really important. Um, otherwise, you know, I'm hopeful that um, I'm hopeful we'll get some kind of regulation. Um, but if not, I'm hopeful that there's like this pressure from investors. Um, from citizens, that companies need to commit to net zero, they need to create plans, they need to adjust their businesses um, in order to be profitable in the future. So hopefully those two things, something interesting is um, I listened to um, a speech like COP26 had like um, Janet Yellen um, and Mark Carney and a number of really interesting people and they proposed um, creating a body like a Fed that's outside of the role of government to govern climate so that it wasn't something that administrations could kind of swing back and forth. That makes it really hard for companies to make long-term plans. Um, so I don't know if that will be something that happens, um, but I think that would be a really interesting idea. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna go to the next question. What are some companies that are involved um, with mitigating climate risk? So um, as far as companies that have committed to science-based targets where they've kind of raised their hand and said, we're going to commit to net zero, um, check out SBTI, the um, um, Scientific-Based um, uh, Target Initiatives. Um, and that has a list of all of the companies that have committed to net zero. Um, to be a part of that list, you either have committed to net zero or you've committed and you've shown plans that have been reviewed. Um, but then um, I'd also take a look at companies that are focused on, um, you know, technologies that are going to be disruptive. So, um, you know, uh, electric vehicles, um, companies that are focused on a more circular economy, less waste, um, those like cities that we're looking at, like that are more like circular in nature. Um, I feel like from a thematics perspective in different industries, there's going to be a lot of disruptive technologies and companies that are able to really make change um, that'll be really exciting um, to be a part of. Okay, the next question, what are considered sustainable assets with regard to ESGs? Uh, great question. So um, I talked to you about our kind of um, our platform. So for us to be a sustainable asset in your prospectus, you need to have a um, financial and a sustain, uh, sustainable objective. So it's going to be in the prospectus that your goal is to have less carbon emissions intensity or your goal is to um, focus on companies that have better ESG characteristics. Um, so in that $200 billion number that BlackRock manages, that includes all of our strategies that are ESG broad, that are thematic, and that are impact. Okay, next question. What kind of resistance are you getting from certain businesses in certain populations? They specify Texas and West Virginia. Um, so uh, it's interesting because I have a call um, with a client in two weeks, and I was talking to the relationship manager today, and they were like, this cannot be a political issue. Um, and I think that that aligns really well with BlackRock's view that it is based off of being a fiduciary and focused on like financial materiality. Um, so I think that um, from like, so we, we talk about it as being like values versus value. So you can invest to align with your values as an individual. So I don't want to invest in certain companies, or I think that this attribute is really important. I want to make sure that I'm investing in companies that have it. Um, but then the next step is to say that, um, and, and values can lead to value because like if everyone believes that, then it'll really move asset prices. Um, but then it's kind of coming at it from a fiduciary perspective. What is financially material? 
And we believe that companies that have better sustainability characteristics, uh, are reducing their carbon emissions intensity, are tilting into kind of clean um, tech opportunities that have created science-based targets. We believe from a value perspective that they will deliver better outcomes than those that are not. Um, so I think it's kind of differentiating between um, values and value. And there's like spaces where it overlaps a little bit, um, but from a financially material fiduciary lens is really kind of, I think, BlackRock's focus. Very interesting. So our next question, um, what do you think will happen to oil stocks and similar companies given that ESG is becoming so important? So I think um, let's hope that we have a big rebound and that coronavirus goes away and we all get to travel and go bananas. Um, and so I think you're gonna see a bit of a rebound, but as it relates to oil and gas companies and energy companies in general, um, our view is that you're going to need every industry in a low carbon economy. It's just a matter of what companies in that industry are focused on clean tech. So some very large oil and gas companies are also some of the largest clean tech companies and have been filing for a number of R&D patents as it relates to renewable energy. Um, so some of those companies are going to be part of the story. It's identifying what companies are transitioning their businesses, um, what companies, for instance, what automotive companies are committing to electric vehicles, what companies are pivoting to where the puck is going. Mm -hmm. So the next question is, what do you think the biggest problem businesses will face when trying to change to be more environmentally friendly? Um, so this is an interesting question because I think that um, there's environmentally friendly and then there's just kind of, you know, pivoting your business in order to align with a net zero framework. Um, you know, what we've actually done, so we have these like capital markets assumptions, they're called CMAs, and there we have this like think tank as part of BlackRock that does all of this research, and um, they've actually recently updated their capital markets assumptions for climate. And I think that the the broad view is like, oh, if I transition my business, if I pivot to be cleaner and focused on net zero, it's going to be a drag on my, um, on my revenues. It's going to be a drag on GDP. And our view is that it's only a drag if you think that climate change isn't real. Um, if you think that climate change is really impacting like physical risks and transition risks. Um, so if you like, then actually making those investments, there'll be a small dip, but we'll actually have a lot larger growth over the long term because we'll be a, an entity that has a reason to exist, right? Um, so it's interesting, like if you look at municipalities, for instance, as temperatures continue to get hotter and hotter, those municipalities are at risk for lower GDP. Um, if it's hotter, people are not gonna be outside being able to be productive. Um, there's gonna be less people that want to move there. Construction will slow down. They'll need to invest more to create dams and protect themselves from physical risks. And so I think that if you really weight the cost of climate change, um, making a change while a short-term cost will actually deliver better performance and opportunity for GDP growth in the future. I want to make a quick comment because that sounds a lot like from the investor side in um, one of his letters, Larry had mentioned patient, the concept of patient capital. And so like also from the investor side, it is we're, we're looking at long term, right? That I think that kind of matches up both on investor and for the companies itself. I mean, is that something that's difficult for investors to get on board with or, you know, uh, uh, accepted? I think it depends on the investor. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I like to think about it as I used to be in distressed investing, right? And so you think about like catching the falling knife, right? Like you're buying a newspaper company. It has a really big coupon. How many coupons do you think you're going to clip before the company's worth nothing? Um, and so that's kind of how I think about it. I think that let's hope that as a country, as a global community, we can come together towards this goal of net zero. Um, I don't really wanna think about it um, that we don't do that because um, I'm worried about my kids, I'm worried about you know everything in general. But I think that if we can do that and we can like transform our businesses, um, you know, as you mentioned, like long-term capital, that was kind of the beginning thesis of a lot of Larry's letters, which like, let's look at the long-term growth. Let's not be very short-term tactical investors. Let's, let's really kind of like 
chart the course and invest in companies for the long-term growth potential. Thank you. Okay, so the next question is concerning this transition. Um, they're asking, what do you think developing countries can do to keep up with the global trend? Um, so I think that um, like the emerging economies are gonna need a lot of support from um, like the uh, developed markets. Um, I think that uh, it's interesting because I'm working with a team to create an emerging market um, sustainable strategy that's tilted into climate. And we're looking at various mechanisms and we're looking at um, carbon emissions intensity. And what that does is it basically penalizes countries that are creating the energy, um, which is really, it's not very nice, right? When you're thinking about like the poor countries versus rich countries, we're the ones that are consuming the energy. That should be a part of our footprint, um, not a country that's doing things in order to create that energy to feed that need. So I think, you know, as we mentioned, it needs to be an equitable transition. We need to come together as a globe to support renewable energy, to support infrastructure and changing of economies to make sure that there are jobs um, and that there's energy um, to make sure that all countries can kind of do that together. Um, it might be on a different time frame. We might need to do it first and then impart that wisdom and help. Um, but I think we need to do it together. Mm -hmm. That's understandable. So we're going to take just a few more questions. Thank you so much for your time. Um, the next one is, do you feel, uh, do you believe financial markets are inherently good for ESG? What does that mean? Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, are the markets good or bad? I mean, I think, um, I think it's like, they're the free markets. I think um, they're going to price risk. And that's why I think that you need to approach sustainability from a financially material perspective um, and focus on those metrics that are going to drive performance. Um, I think it's interesting when you think about like BlackRock's role in sustainability um, in that, you know, we don't want to create strategies that are like pure charity, right? Because I think that what people would rather do is like then the question is, well, should I just invest in XYZ strategy and just allocate some of my gains to charity? I think it's important to make sure that you're creating strategies that deliver long-term performance. Um, otherwise, the whole industry will kind of go away, right? If you're not delivering performance, um, it's hard for investors. It's hard to ask a pension fund um, to invest teachers' money in those strategies. Mm -hmm. um, I think we'll just take one more question. This one is, is it really the most economical for everyone to go net zero? Like in the automotive industry, electrical vehicles are more expensive and the mainstream expensive are higher. Will everyone be motivated to go net zero? Government influence and restriction, are they enough? So I think a big thing you bring up is cost. Um, and so a number of, so something interesting is that wind and solar energy today are cheaper than coal and natural gas. That's old coal, that's new coal. So I think that what we need is we need investment in technology in order to bring costs down um, and make sure that, uh, for instance, if you are not going to, this comes back to my <laughs> environmental econ class, right? If you're not going to buy an electric vehicle, how are you going to be taxed or include the cost your emissions create from not um, driving um, an EV vehicle. So maybe that comes from regulation, maybe that's some um, pressure from investors, um, from consumers. But um, I think that technology is incredible. Um, I mean, forget what phones do, you know, let's, let's target some of that focus on, you know, solving um, net zero and, and solving this, this transition that needs to happen. Understandable. Thank you again for your time today. I really appreciate you coming out to discuss these important topics. Thank for you sure. so much. It was, it was great to have you. Really great questions. Um, the, the future's in your hands. Um, so um, thanks for having me and I'll be, I'll stay around for questions for after this. Thank you. That'd be great. Take care. So from here, I'm going to turn it over to Marley so she can get the second part of this panel discussion going. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and thank you so much, Alex. It was great to hear from you and BlackRock's perspective and everything. Um, now it is my pleasure to welcome Bella Tadaro and Caitlin Drown from Climate Neutral, along with Bree Decker from Avocado Green Mattress. They will be talking a little bit more about how companies track, reduce, and verify their carbon footprint. Hey, thanks for having us. 
Thanks, Mara. And we should be getting some slides up soon. So please bear with us. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Floor is yours. All right, awesome. Um, well, first off, thank you everyone for joining. We're really excited to share more about Climate Neutral. Um, you can go to the next slide. So we're an independent nonprofit organization. And as Mara mentioned, we have an annual certification program um, in process that companies go through each year to measure the carbon footprint, offset it entirely, and then work on uh, reducing emissions over the next 12 to 24 months. So Bella is going to dive a little bit deeper into that process. Um, but fundamentally, we just believe that it should be easier for companies to become carbon neutral and should be easier for consumers to identify those companies. So we're really um, working on two different pieces, basically, of one large movement of one recruiting brands to help them, give them the tools to actually become a carbon neutral company, and then also giving uh, the tools to consumers to not only um, discover those brands that are, have already measured offset and reduced their emissions, but then use um, their platform to actually drive industries over to a carbon neutral industry. Um, so those two, Kind of areas that we're working and focusing in on have that overall goal of decreasing global carbon emissions. Um, so again, we're really excited to be here. We're a two-year-old nonprofit, so we're growing pretty rapidly, which is very exciting. Um, but you know, we're just here as a way to make it again easier for companies to um, go through this process and make it easier for consumers. Yeah, so just to give everyone a little idea of um, where we come from, uh, we were founded by two CEOs uh, in the outdoor industry, the CEO of Peak Design, who makes backpacks and camera equipment, and BioLite, who makes uh, camping equipment and off-grid energy products. Um, and, and, and both companies had gone through the process of becoming climate neutral on their own. And what they learned is that it, it's actually kind of, there are lots of barriers, like measuring your carbon footprint is an intensive process. Sometimes it costs more than it actually costs to offset the carbon footprint. Um, and moreover, they felt that not enough people were doing this. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's not that expensive. So cost really shouldn't be the barrier. We find that most of the companies that go through our certification process find that the whole cost of going climate neutral is something less than half a percent of gross revenue. Um, so it wasn't that expensive, but there were these barriers. Um, so, so climate neutral was born. And to solve both of those problems, we first streamlined a complex process. Um, and so the program that we've built is very clear three steps, and we're going to go into what those are. But in brief, all of the companies that carry our climate neutral certified label have measured the entirety of their carbon footprint. They've offset the whole thing, and they've committed to reduction measures. Um, to reduce the uh, barriers around the measurement step, we built a software tool called the Brand Emissions Estimator that allows brands to go through a carbon footprinting exercise in weeks, not months or years. Um, and then to solve the demand problem and to really catalyze consumers around the idea that they should demand products that are climate neutral, um, our organization offers a label. It's a consumer products label. Um, People put it on the footer of their website, but the idea is that a consumer can build a lifestyle around climate neutral products. They can shop for them the way that they'd shop for organic foods. Um, and in doing that, we put pressure on corporates to, um, to go climate neutral. You can go to the next slide. 
Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, we're only two years old and we're actually certifying nearly 350 brands for their 2020 emissions, which is really exciting. Um, just given how small and young the organization is, there's only four of us. Um, but to give you an idea of the types of companies that are actually becoming climate neutral certified, it's not just you know consumer product um, goods or fashion and apparel, but we're re really working across industries. We have about 12 industries that are represented by our brands, um, from Alter Ego, which is a chocolate company, to Sunski, which is a sunglasses company, to Fetzer Vineyards, which is um, a, a vineyard and wine label. And again, that really just kind of shows that companies of all different shapes and sizes all over the globe are really taking climate change seriously and, you know, making pledges for 2050 is a great start, but quite frankly, we need to move quicker. Um, so we're really excited to have such a robust roster of brands that are in our network. And again, um, last year we certified 150 brands and we offset uh, 230,000 tons of carbon. And so this year we're hopefully going to be certifying um, more than 300 brands and hopefully uh, exceeding that 1 million ton mark of um, offset or carbon that was offset as a result of our certification. Yeah, so and just to provide a little more detail on the certification process, um, it's, a, it's a process that takes companies usually around three months to complete. Um, and the hardest step by far is measuring a carbon footprint. Um, and so the way that works is a company will go out and collect operational data. Um, and then through our software tool, they'll turn that data into a carbon footprint. And the way we're doing that is we're applying what are called emission factors, which is a way to turn an operational unit of data into a, a unit of carbon. After we've gone through that process, which we can accomplish through our brand emissions estimator, which again is greatly reducing the time it takes to produce a carbon footprint, um, then the brand offsets the entirety of its carbon footprint. Um, and an offset is, a uh, financial mechanism that drives um, finance to low carbon projects around the world. So it, the, our brands pay for the kind of ecological service of removing carbon from the global system or offsetting it. Um, and then the last step is to commit to reduction measures into the future. So we have our brands measure and offset their carbon footprints looking backwards. Um, for the previous year, kind of like doing their taxes and then paying for their <laughs> pollution. Um, and then the reduction measures are for going forward. So um, offsets are a really good way to take responsibility for emissions that are already in the atmosphere. And it's a critical way to drive finance to projects that need catalytic funding. But um, at the end of the day, we also need every brand and every company to reduce the carbon that they're putting up into the atmosphere in the first place to produce a single product or a single dollar of revenue. Um, so our companies all commit to two reduction measures as well. And so this is, again, um, as I mentioned, we're not only working with businesses to help them become climate neutral certified, but we're really bringing consumers into the movement. Um, as Bella mentioned, we're doing that through the climate neutral certified label. Uh, we have one level of certification and we have one label. You'll see it in horizontal or vertical, black or white, um, but those are the only you know, iterations of the label. So it keeps consistency. And as consumers see it, again, they'll know that that company has earned that certified label by following the same process that every other company in our network has done. It really sends that signal with a third party validation um, of a company's carbon neutrality claims. And it helps consumers become familiar with the term and actually understand uh, how that's helping to impact climate change. So it's something that we've found um, great success with our brands of that they've said that, you know, they've used not only the label, but the certification as kind of an anchor point for any of their carbon neutrality claims or sustainability work. Um, it's really important for companies right now to think uh, really long-term about how they're communicating about sustainability. 
consumers are smartening up to greenwashing. It's no longer enough to say that you're eco-friendly or that you're sustainable. They want to know exactly what you're doing. So we, again, we're focused solely on carbon emissions. So this label, again, um, makes it much more transparent of a process because they have a third-party verification. And then also on our website, we report on all the details of their certification. So you can see a company's carbon footprint, how they're offsetting their emissions, how much money they spend on offsets, and then how they're reducing their emissions. Uh, in the next few weeks, we'll start publishing the reduction action um, progress of the brands that were certified last year. And again, this is to get consumers really familiar with what they're doing and make it more of an open dialogue. You know, when you talk about carbon, tons of carbon, that you might think you know exactly what you're talking about, but once you actually dig into the numbers, it's quite substantial. Um, I was just working with a brand today and their carbon footprint was 6,700 tons. And I was using uh, the EPA's greenhouse gas equivalency calculator. And it was saying that there, that's the equivalent amount of carbon that's sequestered by like 8,800 um, acres of forests in the US over the course of a year. So you're thinking about how big of a forest that is that's pump, trying to sequester all that carbon just for one medium-sized company. So it really kind of helps consumers understand the urgency of the crisis, but then pairs that up with um, an action that they can take in their everyday lives that can have substantial and monumental impacts on how business fundamentally views its role in tackling climate change. Um, so we're really excited to start seeing the label out across the universe. Uh, my friends and family always let me know and they see it and the more folks um, that we have in the network, the more consumers we bring into the movement, which then pushes more companies to get involved as well. And actually, um, I had a friend tell me last night that they saw our label on a mattress company's advertisement. I was like, oh, was it avocado? And they're like, yes, it was. <laughs> that segues nicely into introducing Brie, who's um, joining us from Avocado Green. And um, so Mara, if you can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so again, the it's becoming more and more clear that consumers are looking to companies to do more than just make a profit. I was reading a statistic earlier today that was saying that um, global consumers are four times like more likely to purchase from a brand that has a strong purpose behind it. And, you know, consumers and just everyday individuals are really taking climate change more seriously than in the past and that they want to support the companies that are doing the right thing. From 2015 to 2019, NYU found that sustainably marketed products grew 7.1 times faster than their conventional counterparts. So again, that shows a trend in the industry that's not likely to um, you know, go away anytime soon. I was on a panel earlier today that was talking about the importance of having social good and a uh, purpose-driven mission for every company. And we we're talking about how it's really expected out of brands, especially after COVID, that consumers don't think it's enough just to, you know, do a one-time uh, initiative or volunteer program, but they really are expecting brands to incorporate their social and environmental um, causes into the DNA of the brand. So it's something that companies we've seen in our network and beyond of that companies that are doing this, um, you know, are really benefiting from it and building loyalty amongst their customers and their employees too. Um, I read a stat that Gen Z uh, is 83% of Gen Z is using environmental and social um, responsibility as a core consideration of whether or not to accept a job from a company. So again, it, it goes beyond just consumer benefits, but also from the employee engagement um, piece as well. So with that being said, I'm excited to introduce Brie from Avocado and she can tell us a little bit more um, about Avocado's experience and how, um, you know, what brought them to climate neutral and the impact um, for the brand that they've seen by actually measuring, offsetting, and reducing their emissions with us three years in a row now. So congratulations. Thanks, Caitlin. I know it's been so awesome because you guys have been around for three years and we haven't been around that much longer either, but we've scaled at such an exceptional rate and we've kind of grown with you guys. So we've been, <laughs> it's just been such an honor to have been involved from the very beginning. Um, in terms of the certification itself, I mean, like B Corp certification, which tends to look at like an overarching view of the company, the process I found was really enlightening, but in a little bit more of like a granular type of way. Um, so when it came down to, you know, the product level, like when, when I was first thinking about our products, I'm thinking, okay, a mattress is comprised of like latex, you know, cotton, wool, some basic components, right? But as you start to go down the certification process, you realize the extensity and how many product, how many materials actually come together to make up your product line. 
So it gives you a really good understanding of just, you know, the amount of um, effort and labor and materials that it takes to go into each individual item that you're selling, right? Um, as, and then like, like you keep going down the tunnel, right? And learning more and more. And so you go down and you start learning about your suppliers and the supply chain and how much each of your suppliers are doing within their particular operations in order to reduce their footprint. You know, so you can start conversations at the, the birth of the product and understand a lot about, you know, reducing wastewater or reusing it entirely, renewable energy initiatives, that sort of thing. And then even down to our own operations, I think, um, you know, this, this initiative has become so ingrained within the company that I hear uh, a lot of conversations taking place around carbon emissions as we're taking into account different considerations across the board when it comes to different areas of the business. So for example, when we're opening new retail locations or, um, you know, deciding, trying to source uh, renewable energy suppliers or optimizing our downstream shipments uh, routes, you know, in, in the ways in which we deliver our products and stuff, it really does feel like it's become um, pretty integrated into the entire business, which is a, a super cool thing to witness. Um, the carbon footprint, you know, I felt a little bit surprised by it. Um, you know, our, a lot, all, of our, all of our products are made up of natural and organic components, right? And there tends to be, I think, as particularly among people who don't work in this space, a uh, conception that, um, you know, these materials are leaps and bounds better than synthetic ones. And it's true in a lot of ways, right? Like, uh, you know, you, you look into uh, the environmental impact, but, you, you know, you also come to realize that the, even though these products come from the earth, they're still going through processing mechanisms. They still have to be transported from one area to the other. They still require water. You know, there's still a lot of different steps that go from making cotton that's grown in the ground into a fiber or a fabric that is then put into your, your product. So, um, you know, I was a little bit surprised by the level of impact that the components that we use are still having. But I will say that there are different ways to mitigate that within your supply chain. You know, and so even um, Climate Neutral has done an amazing job. I think Caitlin or Isabella, one of the two of you said it perfectly, like you've made this process really accessible to brands who otherwise may have not had had um, the resources to go to go down this route and do these things. As you explore the certification, and as you explore your own impacts of your carbon emissions, I think it's really beneficial to eventually do LCAs on your products and have those conversations with your suppliers because the tool is super amazing, but it may not be accounting for some of the specifics and the details in terms of what's going on in your supply chain where your, your emissions are actually being reduced. Um, so I think that's like one you know, piece of advice I have for organizations, like use the tool, take advantage of it totally. But, you know, this is a kind of like an evolutionary process. And like they had talked about, we want to see reduction methods, we're growing, we're scaling, but how are we also keeping the rate of our emissions low relative to the growth of the business? And I think a lot of that can be done at the supply chain level. Free. On that note, I was kind of wondering, what have you specifically learned about like your supply chain going through the climate neutral process? So I know you're talking about how like there's certain things you didn't know that were happening or ways that you could be re doing reductions. But have you learned anything specific specifically about um, your supply chain in general? You know, I learned so and not even just through climate neutral, but even going through like the B Corp certification process and stuff. Um, how much are how much this kind of mission is also integrated within the supply chain? You know, like I go in and I start having conversations, and I didn't realize how much um, we're because we own portions of our supply chain. You know, like we're a little bit different from other uh, mattress manufacturing companies because we own our latex farm, we own our wool collective, and I learned you know how much um, work we're doing at the 
you know, the social level with, with the people that are, that are working in these places. Our farms are in India, right? So we do a ton of work around like, you know, bringing medical camps and bringing resources to these communities that typically don't have them. That's a little bit more on the social side, which you guys had touched on earlier within the, within the, um, within this presentation, but, you know, even on the science-based side and on, on the, that, in that realm of things, um, just how much, you know, the, the, the systems that they have going within these factories and the manufacturing plants are closed loop systems, right? So energy, water is collected after certain materials are cleaned and rinsed and it goes through that process that water is collected and reused and repurposed for other things. And same with the energy, like they have to, um, you know, latex goes through like goes through a baking process and that heat is, you know, transported from one area to the other. Things that I'm um, honestly just now kind of breaking into detailed work within our supply chain, so I can't fully speak to it, but I did learn a lot about, um, you know, the different initiatives and ways that the, the people that we work with overseas have innovated within their own practices to kind of encompass this mission as well. Yeah, I think that's great to hear because in reality, like, each company can do, you know, like offset their work and stuff, but a lot of the actual reductions happen like so much down the supply chain, upstream, downstream emissions that are in like scope three that no one was like, how do we, you know, work to reduce these? What are we doing? Exactly. Um, so I think it's really great to kind of go into your supply chain and be like, do you guys want to work on these things too? And like, how can you help um, us get to our goals? Totally. Yeah. And they're oftentimes so more than willing, you know, like they're, they're equally excited about these things. These are oftentimes small and rural communities. And so the cleaner their practices are, the cleaner their communities stay. And it's just a better process overall. Right. And then one other question that you kind of touched on, and I saw it in the chat addressed a little bit, like, what do you do as a brand that has like no data for climate stuff? So if you are coming in and you're like, we're a new brand, we're starting out and I don't, and I want to address my climate emissions, but you know, how do we kind of do that? If I don't have any data, where do I start? Well, I think the climate neutral team's done a really good job of giving you an awesome outline of what it is that you need to collect. You know, some of the some of the data points are going to be more straightforward than others, just like gathering energy bills for all of your facilities, that sort of thing. But the spreadsheets and the, you know, the tools that they've put together um, have done a really good job. And what I've found is just that, you know, the first year for us, I think this was a little bit harder of um, a route to go down. We weren't used to collecting this type of data. We were a new brand, you know, it was um, a little bit heavier of a lift in order to go in and get those reports. But now we've done this three years in a row, we're gonna be doing it again. You know, this is a, a yearly thing that we go through and so, um, as the brand's grown, we've gotten, you know, really solid teams in place in terms of finance and operations, logistics, all that sort of stuff. And they're used to us asking these types of questions now. So it's, um, it's, you know, especially as a younger brand, it's a cool opportunity because you're able to kind of ingrain these practices within the business from the very start, rather than being an established brand and going back and trying to get all the numbers. Um, I've always, you know, I've talked about that with B Corp certification too, on like other presentations and stuff. It's like, no, there's never a time that's too early to start, you know, like the earlier, the better. <laughs> it honestly makes it easier moving forward. So exactly. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, well, we can kind of open. I have a few questions that I was planning to ask you as well, which I already asked some of them, but um, also the climate neutral team. So we can just ask a few here and then we'll open it up um, to the rest of the questions from the audience. So if you guys have more questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, but one of my next questions is in relation to just people taking action on climate. So um, any of you guys can jump in, but how do you inspire people to take action on climate when individuals can't necessarily like wrap their head around like what climate change is or how much carbon it kind of is? And Caitlin kind of touched on the idea that it's like so much and so huge that no one really gets it. Um, so how do you inspire people? Yeah, um, I can kick it off. So one thing that I always tell people is that we, um, you definitely should do everything you can within your own life and uh, making decisions, you know, whether it's 
eat less meat or try to drive less, um, you know, kind of really thinking about how you can lower your own impact. But I recommend that folks use their voice. I think that's the most powerful thing that they can do. Um, in addition to, you know, activism and, um, you know, lobbying local politicians to make changes that are going to bring us closer to a decarbonized world, um, use your voice when it comes to companies because companies do listen. They listen to their customers very, very uh, well, which is a great thing. And we've actually had quite a few folks that have tagged us in social media posts, um, asking their favorite brands to look into the certification and it's actually led to companies being certified. So I always tell folks that, you know, the average American um, uh, has a carbon footprint about 24 tons a year. If you can drive a company with a 10,000 foot, um, 10,000 10, ton foot footprint uh, to, you know, go through certification, that's a monumental impact that's much uh, more uh, impactful than anything you would have on your own. So just use your voice and tell your favorite brands that you want them to step up and understand their carbon footprint so they can offset it and get to work on reducing future emissions. And also tell your employer too, as I mentioned before, um, employees want to work for companies that are doing the right thing when it comes to environmental issues. So use your voice, tell people, um, tell companies what you want them to do. And I guarantee they're going to start listening because it's getting to that tipping point where if a company isn't taking meaningful um, action on climate, they are going to be, you know, seeing the, uh, the repercussions of that from consumer loyalty and employee engagement. So my biggest piece of advice is to really, um, you know, lobby those that have large uh, uh, emissions and tell them that you want them to do something about it. Mm -hmm. That's great, because I think that also touches on Alexander's point from BlackRock about just like resilience as a company, and you really have to be able to measure this stuff and talk about it. Otherwise, people are going to be like, what are they doing? And like, your head's just kind of in the sand. So I think that's great. Um, and another one I kind of addressed a little bit, and I don't know how familiar people are on this call about like greenhouse gas emissions and different scopes, but um, what I hear a lot of times is why people want to why it's important to measure your scope three emissions. Like if your operations are usually in scope one and scope two, and like that's your direct operations, like why does it matter to address scope three? Yeah, I'm happy to, to take that one. So we work with um, lots of uh, consumer goods brands. And so they make things like steel water bottles or dresses or mattresses. And across all of those product types, when you look at a carbon footprint, the scope three emissions, and when we talk about scopes, we're using language from the greenhouse gas protocol, which is the accounting language for this stuff. It was written in the early 2000s, but scope three just means your supply chain. Um, and when we look at carbon footprints, like, 95% or more of the carbon footprint at the organizational level is coming from scope three. So when a company comes out and makes a commitment to, you know, net zero or neutral or whatever for scope one and two, take like a magnifying glass and really like look at that because what that usually means is that they're offsetting the emissions from their offices and maybe like vehicles that they own. Um, so many companies, even like super big companies, work with contract manufacturers, which means that they don't own their manufacturing facilities, which means that they don't control the like electricity that's consumed in those facilities or the fuels that are burned there. That's a huge part of the footprint. So are all of the emissions embedded in the products um, when they arrive to that facility. So that's what's making up like the majority of, of a carbon footprint. And so if you ignore scope three, you're just looking at like, so if you're talking about like, a, I mean, avocado mattress, like that would be kind of ridiculous to just look at like what's being consumed at your office because you all have this like long trail of responsibility that goes all the way back to rubber farms and it passes through, um, you know, like small towns and, and like all of that really matters. And Brie talked really well about how it's great to learn about that. Um, but it, it's, it's also like you're creating demand for this product and it's touching so many things across the supply chain. And um, we see it as your, as your full climate impact. 
So with that being said, like, how do you actually create reductions if like so much of it is in your supply chain? Like, how are you actually going to make consistent reductions to get you to eventually net zero if you're not just climate neutral and like maybe climate positive? That's kind of thrown around sometimes. So how do you actually make those reductions? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I, I'd be interested actually to hear from Brie about how she's thought about reductions, because I kind of just get to like read a lot of reduction plans, but not never implement them. Um, but we've seen our brands be very creative and to act as a collective too. So it's been really fun to see them kind of come together and bounce ideas off of one another. But um, there are so many things you can do like the way you design a product the the materials that you choose to put into it matters a lot at, at the corporate um, inventory level so if you were to switch to a recycled material that could reduce your impact from that material by as much as 50 to 70 percent depending on the material um you can you know like air freight is like the worst sin in, 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 in this, in this stuff. So like anytime a brand can do better demand planning, um, which it's cheaper for them. It's just like usually all around better. If you're planning things well, you can reduce air freight and it, it dramatically reduces your carbon footprint. Um, there are a million other creative things that our, our brands have, have put together, but I'd be interested to hear from Brie about how she's thought about working with in the supply chain to make reductions. Yeah, that's the, it's a hard one because we, you know, we're scaling so much as a business, like we're growing, we're launching new brands, we're go, going into new markets. There's so many things happening across the board. And so my main goal, when I think about reduction, I mean, our emissions are going to grow, you know, that it's, it's inevitable given what's going on within, within our company right now, but we can keep our, the growth of our emissions lower than the growth of our company, you know, like the percentage, the proportion, we can keep that number down. And, um, you know, like to, to Isabel's point, I think there's a ton. Our, our emissions definitely come mostly from scope three. Um, if we didn't count those, you know, our, our footprint would be tiny. So, um, you know, look, going back to the supply chain and sourcing organic and working with the suppliers and really starting, because up until this point, we've used climate neutrals calculator to kind of understand our footprint. I think we're hitting a point within the business where we want to get a little bit more granular with it and start to really understand given our own unique specific practices within the supply chain where we're at with things. So I think that will um, help shed a lot of light upon things. And then I think we also have a ton of power because in addition to owning part of our supply chain, you know, we own our, some of our own last, um, last mile shipping service. The, you know, if you order an avocado product, a lot of time it's, it's delivered to your home in an avocado branded truck rather than like UPS or um, FedEx or some, especially in, in, in some of our, our major markets, right? And so in that, we have a lot more control to reduce there as well, because we can use electric vehicles. You know, we can use uh, specific types of technology to optimize our shipping routes and that sort of thing. And then making sure also, you know, we're on, our, um, we're on the way to pursuing zero waste certification within our manufacturing facilities. And so, you know, even today I was down in the factory, like looking at the different types of materials that are being discarded of and thinking of ways to reduce our waste and upcycle all of those materials, turn them into new products, even if they're just donated. You know, there's just a ton of potential all, all the way around in terms of um, reducing emissions, but I think it does require getting a little bit more granular with, with the process, at least in our case. Yeah, that makes sense, especially as like a growing brand. It's probably really hard to yeah. uh, grow and reduce, but without getting too granular. <laughs> um, and then my last question before we move it on to the audience is, I know um, Alexandra touched on SBTIs and those kind of reduction commitments. How do you think the climate neutral certification relates or kind of corresponds with SBTIs? I know some of the brands that like you guys are working with are setting them, but do you think it's like great if you just do climate neutral or I guess just like, what is, what are your thoughts on both? Yeah. So, so we formally recommend that companies join the science-based targets initiative in our standards. 
Um, so we see that like absolutely as the gold standard for um, reduction planning in the long term. Um, the SBTI framework is um, it's it's very geared towards um, like a net zero in 2030 or 2050. So the timelines are a little bit longer, and, and so you do um, you do planning that like is in accordance with climate science, and it's super important to have those kind of long term plans and to set a baseline and for it to be on record with that organization. Um, that complements our program very well. Basically, we're also asking for you to make reduction commitments. Um, our requirement is that those commitments are on a two-year timeline. Um, and so we want to know, and, and we want to know qualitatively, what are you doing? Um, so the, the, the Science-Based Targets Initiative will ask you to set quantitative goals over a relatively long amount of time. I think the programs complement each other really well because then we're because we're consumer facing and because we're asking you to tell a story to your consumer who might scan a QR code and wind up on your profile page, a 20% reduction in your scope two in year five, like doesn't mean that much to a consumer. But if you say we're going to install solar panels at our office, that's something that a consumer can understand and resonate with. Um, and so the programs complement each other and we formally recommend SBTI. Um, and yeah, would, would love every brand in the world to do both um, and, and think that they should. <laughs> oh, I realize I'm on mute, um, but yeah, that's great. And then I think we can turn it over to Ernesto who will help field some of the audience questions. Yes, uh, my turn here. Great information, <laughs> by the way. You guys can hear me, correct? Okay, great. Uh, a couple of people have asked, how do you validate, I guess, a measurement? I'm not sure exactly what they mean by that, but that's a few of them have asked that question. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just start because I'm this, the standards gal, and then I'll kick it over to Bree to actually talk through what this process is like. Um, we, so I've said a couple of times that our, our tool reduces the time it takes to create a carbon footprint. And so I think the red flags that go up are like, well, then how do you know that it's valid? Um, the way our tool like works is, is first the brand goes through an economic input output model and gets a coarse understanding of their footprint. And so the way that works is like you tell us basically what you're spending. And then we're flowing out your spending in a predictable way based on the sector that you belong in and where you're geographically located. And we have estimates for every aspect of your carbon footprint. And the estimates tend to be high. We then have brands collect operational data, which that's what Bree talked about, like the, the tools to aggregate utility bills and all that stuff. That data is used to override the model's output. So, um, that's just kind of like to explain how the tool works a bit. Um, when brands are over a certain revenue threshold, just like when you're, you know, you make enough money, you need your, you need to be audited. Um, and we require that brands over a certain revenue threshold get, get their footprint audited or verified to international standards. And there are a couple of different international standards that we'd accept, but the most common is the ISO standard. Embry has been through that process and she can talk through what a verification process is like, um, but that's how we're verifying footprints. Yeah, there's no cheating. <laughs> we don't get to cheat. <laughs> um, no, I mean, we, so we partner with a third party. Uh, we've used Sustainable Business Council the past few years. They've been really awesome in helping us out. Um, and basically, you know, we have to show all of the, they're not auditing the tool itself, they're auditing our inputs, 
right? And so they have a lot of questions in terms of why is your scope one look like this? Where, you know, show us some examples of your utility bills, show us some examples of your natural gas bills. We want to see records from that you obtained from finance in terms of employee travel, um, how many employees you have located at each location. And then the supply chain is obviously the most complex part, at least in our case. So, you know, we log in, we get on calls with them, we log into our internal systems and kind of show them our purchase orders, um, you know, containers that came from overseas and um, give them access to all of the records that we use to put the inputs into the tool essentially. So that's a very high level explanation of how they make sure that we're, uh, uh, we're holding ourselves and climate neutral is holding us accountable. <laughs> Pretty dry stuff, but it's uh, good to be like dotting I's and crossing T's. Okay. Uh, the next question was, uh, somebody said that they worked for a company that was attempting to measure its carbon footprint, and it was a bit of a challenge to collect the data. Do you have any best practices that perhaps you can share to make it easier to collect uh, from these companies? Yeah, I would like, again, just toss this right back to Brie because she's done a wonderful job of implementing systems so that her data is cleaner by the time we get to the certification process. And that's like the number one way to do this is to not treat your carbon accounting period as the only time when you're thinking about this, but rather like to be cleaning your data and putting good systems in place for the whole year so that you can track these things. Um, and then I think the other part of that answer is just the way we've built our tool has a backstop. And that backstop is all of those estimates from the economic input output model. Um, and so when we work, especially with smaller companies who have less supply chain, supply chain transparency and less bandwidth, um, we, we expect that they will rely on the estimates to a higher degree and we apply an assurance padding and that's common practice when you're using economic input output data to produce a carbon footprint. Um, but yeah, the, the estimates are really good for kind of moving quickly, um, but being confident that the number that the, the number you're getting is high enough that you can claim climate neutrality if you do offset it. Um, but I'll let Brie talk about like the system she's put in place because it's been really wonderful to like watch Avocado kind of go through the process a couple of times. And I think it, it's gotten easier. <laughs> yeah, well, I, and I think I touched on this a little bit earlier too, just in terms of having these conversations pretty consistently and knowing where you, you know, what data you need to get and then making that a continuous process in terms of tracking those things. What I will also add on to that is that you know, we as a sustainable brand focus on a lot of different types of certifications. Like climate neutral is not our only one. We have global organic textile standard. You know, we're looking at recycled content standards for, brand, for some of our products that use recycled materials. Um, B Corp, you know, we're moving into fair trade, all these sorts of things. And so what I will say is that for brands that are interested in going down the climate neutral route and are selling consumer products and are interested in uh, obtaining other certifications to these data points that you're collecting, particularly around the supply chain and that sort of thing, are going to apply across the board, right? And so these are really good conversations to be having because I don't need this just for climate neutral. I need this for every other certification that we're working on as well. And these certifications are the, one of the main reasons that our customers shop with us. You know, I think Alexandra talked about that earlier um, in this presentation, just about how much consumers are waking up and kind of putting more demands on companies to, to be transparent and act responsible in different spaces. And so the more certifications you have, the more it just backs up your products and your practices within the organization. So just kind of a side note, but um, relevant, I think. Okay, perfect. The next one is what would be the process if a fresh a fashion brand uh, wanted their product to be uh, certified, but it was dyed or the garment was dyed? Yeah, so um, as I understand it, um, many fashion garments are dyed. Um, I, I think, yes, that can be a harmful environmental practice. Um, what we want to understand is what were the climate impacts. And so as I understand it, it takes steam to dye a garment um, and lots of 
chemicals. And so the way we would go about that is to understand, well, how much steam and which chemicals, and we would count everything. And then, and then that brand would be responsible for then offsetting the climate impacts from that dyeing process. Um, and then maybe they realize that dyeing is a hot spot in their footprint. And that's a wonderful reduction measure is to change the way that you're producing your product to be more climate friendly. Um, we, I think anyone who works with businesses and also is a climate, like we're climate people, like we want what's best for the climate. Um, so there's this tension when you're a climate nonprofit that's working with corporations, right? It's like, how, how big of a tent do you build? Who do you let in? Like, we have these conversations sometimes about, you know, like, would we certify a cement company? Like, would that be better for the world or would it be greenwashing? And so these are like these really hard questions that um, I think are much bigger than climate neutral, frankly. Like the, the, what we're asking companies to do is to take responsibility for their climate impact in the world and to reduce it. And so we want to build a pretty big tent we want lots of companies to be doing that. We think every company should do that. It's cheap, <laughs> like it costs at less than half a percentage point of total revenue. So this is, every company has the responsibility to be doing this. We're living through a crisis um, and it's, you know, it, it's, it's something that customers are requiring. Um, so we want everyone to be able to, to go through the program. Um, and, and I think that that's, an important part of of how we're thinking about the problem the problem and of course we would never certify an oil company and we think very critically about the the brands that that we we do kind of certify and work with but um it's it's about meeting brands where they're at and then helping them to come along on the process um and to become more sustainable and more climate friendly through the certification In your experience, what's been the most challenging company to certify? Maybe a success story? Yeah, I guess this one's for me too. Um, uh, well, our, our certification program is, is standard. So every brand does the same thing. Um, and it's binary. Either you do it and you get the label or you don't. <laughs> and then, you know, you're not a certified climate neutral brand. Um, so in that way, it's actually like, it, it's really hard to say what's the hardest company or what's the easiest company because the program's standardized and very much on purpose so that when a consumer sees the label, it means the same thing on all of the products that carry it. Um, I, that being said, like, you know, it, I think, yeah, hardest is hard. I, I, I don't know. I mean, sometimes there are like very like niche questions about a footprint um, that take additional research or you bring in like Breeze um, brought up the idea that like she might want to learn more about her supply chain than our tool affords. And that's really exciting when brands choose to do that. They they go out and hire another firm who would perform a life cycle assessment, and it would it would be a real study of of that unique supply chain. And so that's not hard for us to certify. It's you know more detailed than what our software tool can do, but that's very much on purpose. We're building a tool that allows this to scale. Um, once a brand, you know, reaches a point where they're ready to really investigate their supply chain, then we're so excited to, to see that kind of initiative. Um, but that doesn't make them harder to certify it. In fact, makes them like, you know, a shining example in the cohort. So I don't know, I, I'm not answering the question, but, um, yeah, all of our brands teach us something and it's, it's fun. I had to throw a curve in, that's why. And with that, I think uh, we've actually run out of time. I'm going to hand this over to Professor Diaz. Thank you for the information.
And Professor Theus, if you want to go ahead and uh, take over here. Thank you very much, uh, Ernesto, and thank you to our panelists, and thank you to our Net Impact team. Uh, very much appreciate the conversation that we've had this afternoon. Um, my name is Jeff Thies. I direct the Institute for Business Ethics and Sustainability, and um, I really appreciate a couple of dimensions of what you've been sharing, which is really fundamentally the business practices of designing businesses around sustainable performance. and services to the businesses fundamentally around auditing, measuring, you know, establishing standards and performing against those standards. All of those pieces go together. And also you've used words like hope and should, and I want to live in a world that, and that's a way in which we think and encourage business students and business practitioners to think is that relationship between what should we be doing and what are we doing and how do we make that real and, and more fulfilled, you know, in our current practices and moving forward. I wonder if for each of you, if I could just ask a question of what motivates you in this work? There's a personal dimension of this. And in a second, I'm going to ask about a leadership dimension of this, but a personal dimension of this. Uh, what, what motivates you and, and kind of what, how did this resonate in your spirit that becomes a part of your professional lives. Um, yeah, I can start. Uh, I grew up on Cape Cod, so it's definitely an interesting, lovely place to grow up. So I um, grew up, you know, spending every day at the beach during the summer. I grew up horseback riding, so I was outdoors all the time. And I remember when I was in third grade, my mom telling me about climate change and just being an innocent uh, child, I was like, well, why aren't we doing something about this? Um, and my mom trying to explain it to me, I remember she was like trying to go through why we hadn't done anything. And this was, you know, back in the 90s. And just that kind of stuck with me over the years of like seeing the uh, I guess like hostility around it and just like the bipartisanship and it just fundamentally I was like there's something going on why aren't we doing the right thing to tackle this so I've always tried to kind of like grasp on to like you know seven eight-year-old Caitlin <laughs> and, and using that to kind of drive me throughout my career um, being passionate about communications and psychology and behavior change and using that to really open up um, the conversation around this and craft communications and programs that don't scare people because climate change is overwhelming. And if you think hard about it, like I have my days where I'm like, oh God, are we ever <laughs> start making the right decisions? But um, for me personally, just over the past probably like five years or so, um, I worked at World Resources Institute after college and just seeing all of the amazing work that was coming out of that organization really had kind of um, led me on this path to keep focused on all the people that were doing this amazing work and so uh, motivated and um, passionate about it. And so that's really kind of led me to climate neutral and bringing that enthusiasm and actionable like insights to both companies and consumers and focusing less on what's not working and really kind of going, um, diving into what is working and expanding upon that. Thank you. Thank you. I can jump in now. Um, so um, I think mine's uh, similar, but different. I, I've always been like interested in like the planet and biology and how everything kind of works together. Um, and uh, I've been in finance my whole life, so I've been like less focused on changing the world from that perspective. But I think, you know, after, you know, working for a number of years, um, you know, we all love our job someday and we all hate our job someday. And I think that to me, feeling like you're doing something to move the ball forward, to make life a little bit better, like using my finance background and what I'm good at to try to advance sustainability um, makes me feel a lot better about what I'm doing. I have two daughters, so I feel like I'm doing something to make sure there's a great planet here for them to enjoy. Um, and that's why, why I love being a part of sustainability. Thank you, thank you. I can go next. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I've always also had an interest in, in environmental issues, particularly from the policy side of things. You know, I studied um, public policy and political science in college with the idea of working towards sustainable environmental policy. But after college, I was very fortunate because I got the chance to travel a lot and live in foreign countries and spend a lot of time in um, indigenous communities, particularly in Latin America. And I saw, um, you know, firsthand the effects that unrefined capitalism was having on these indigenous populations in areas of people, you know, these, these people have been relying on the earth and its resources for forever, you know, since the beginning of, of the birth of their populations. And so, um, you know, just after developing such close relationships with these individuals around the world, it really, it, it, it touched me, you know, and it, and it gave me that much more of a drive to, to get involved in this space and work for not only, you know, our good, but of everyone all around, all around the globe. Thank you. Um, well, this all really resonates everything that everyone has said. I too was a kid who like loved salamanders and the world around me. Um, and uh, then, yeah, <laughs> grew up and also studied environmental policy actually. And um, spent my early career in East Africa where I, yeah, observed just like how truly unfair this is. Um, and what brought me back home to work on corporate sustainability is the fact that like, I was working in off-grid energy, which is an amazing solution, absolutely critical. Like it's super important as we transition um, and like bring people online and we have to figure it out. Um, the like carbon credit mechanism is a fabulous way to finance that industry. And so I was really excited about this idea that like, we could grow the voluntary carbon market and provide finance to these projects on the ground that are super important to both like advancing justice and also um, solving the climate crisis. Um, and then also like it just like this is where the responsibility is, right? Like all these companies making stuff. Um, that's the problem. Like that's where like the real responsibility lies. And, and so I, I loved working on the ground in East Africa and learned a lot about the problem and why I care about it. Um, but we have to change our systems of consumption and production in the developed world. And I think there's a way to do that with business. Um, but uh, it, that's why it's been so exciting to be at Climate Neutral and to get to like learn from everybody on the panel tonight. Thank you so much. Um, Isabella, you just used the, the word justice and, um, and I, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, you know, uh, we had a uh, presentation from the director of the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan for the city of Long Beach. Uh, and she was speaking about the fact that there are neighborhoods in that city whose life expectancy for children is greater than the life expectancy variance between the United States and Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's happening within, within neighborhoods within two miles. And, and, and it is the case that we know so much that often those who are harmed the most are those the most vulnerable, at times communities of color or other vulnerable communities. I'm wondering um, your sense of that and how does this, or how do you see those communities represented in the decision-making, the employment universe, the participants in the solution seeking at the same time that they are communities impacted disproportionately. That's been a theme that we've talked to tonight. But I just wonder how, what, how you see that space. Yeah, well, thank you so much for asking the question. I think it's really important to talk about that um, in an event like tonight's conversation. Um, yeah, well, the, the, the thing about it is the, the people who have the most to lose as temperatures rise and climate changes are also closest to the solutions. Um, so I think a really poignant example is the way that um, gender and climate intersects. And so, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that you could say that's like terrible about the way that gender and climate intersects. Like, 
women will suffer like way more. I mean, they carry water longer distances and um, the, as, as the, like people are forced out of their homes because of acute climate crises, they will be refugees who are at risk to their physical like bodies. And um, so all this stuff is terrible. The thing is like women are also closest to the solutions. Uh, I mean, women represent a, an enormous um, like majority of the subsistence farmers in the world. Um, so they know how to farm in a way that's climate safe. Um, and so that's really exciting. And I think that that's um, applicable, not just in the developing world um, when we're talking about subsistence farming, but also um, like when you look at new technologies to address, address the problem or to think through just all this whole landscape of solutions that we have in front of us, um, the communities that are most at risk know how to fix the problems. <laughs> they just need to be asked and they need to be involved and they need to be given finance. Um, and so I think that we have the responsibility to bring everybody into the conversation. Um, and and um, yeah, thanks for asking the question. Of course. And, and thank you so much, Isabella. Any other reflection on that, that question from your perspectives? I mean, I think um, we, we've been doing a lot of research on identifying um, what we can do to provide capital to like historically undercapitalized communities um, and uh, have done a lot of research to find like KPIs and metrics that we can use to identify those specific municipalities um, that have lower life expectancies, um, less access to education. Um, so you know, I think from my perspective, I think being able to identify those communities and find ways to like provide capital um, to allow them, as Isabella mentioned, to like have the capital to do what they need to do to get an education to, you know, like come and, um, you know, be a part of the larger workforce and have just those opportunities um, and the support uh, is really important. And I think um, the last year has been really, you know, challenging as it relates to, you know, racial equity. But I think that if you look at the silver lining is that we're having this conversation where we might not have had it a year ago. And so hopefully we continue to have this conversation. We continue to do research and drive capital into those spaces. Thank you. I just want to add to that, you know, from the business perspective, like the private sector has so much potential to produce effects, right? Like the private sector can be incredibly powerful because we have capital just, you know, available to use. Um, the, what I love about the B Corp uh, application is that it is a free tool for all businesses to use. Like you do not have to go down the route to get certified to use that application. And they inc incorporate all of these concepts under the community section. So they're looking at how much of your revenue or how much of your spend goes to minority and women owned businesses. You know, they're looking at where, what zip codes your employees live in and how many of your employees live in low and middle income neighborhoods. They're looking at, you know, Alexander talked about it earlier, the percentage of management and board of directors and that sort of thing. People in power within the organization are women and those of color and that sort of thing. So um, if you are a business or if you're working for a business, I saw someone post in the question box, you know, what can a, a small business do to kind of like measure their impacts and start to make a change and there are free tools out there available for you to use to just kind of get a benchmark and understand where you're at and continue to improve upon those things as you scale and grow. Thank you. You know, I, um, we're, we're getting close to the end and I really appreciate you guys are all on the East Coast, so you're really uh, serving us beautifully. Thank you so much. I wonder if we could just ask each of your observations about a piece that was pointed to by what Alexandra said earlier, which was this relationship between value and values. And that question about really what is important and how leadership is critical for defining that importance and driving the direction of that importance about what is of value and then how that translates into the business practice. Um, Brie, you, you, you mentioned that business can be powerful and business is already really powerful, right? Question is power oriented toward what? So, so I wonder if you could 
just as a final reflection, reflect on what you see as the key leadership dimensions or leadership components to this question of orientation toward impact that really has been a, a key dimension of all of your sharing this evening. Yeah, I mean, I think a really powerful tool to do that is to conduct like a materiality matrix, which essentially is looking at, you know, all of the different points that the business touches in terms of environmental and social impact, and then the relevance of those different points to the stakeholders and how important they are to your stakeholders, which is not just, um, you know, your board of directors, but it's also your employees, your investors, the communities in which you're operating, your supply chain, all of those things. And so by understanding what, what points of the business are having the most impact and then which of those points are the most important to your, your stakeholders, you're able to kind of conduct, you know, con formulate a strategy in terms of where to focus your efforts, because the realm of sustainability and social impact is so broad. You know, it can, my role as director in this company can look completely different within um, an organization within a different, uh, that's operating in like a different industry, right? And so you do kind of have to decide what, um, where you're gonna focus your efforts and what that process looks like. And so I think uh, just having those conversations internally and externally with the people who are touching points and understanding where the highest, you know, um, effects are coming from based on your operations is going to be key within that, within that process. Thank you. Um, yeah, I can kind of just jump into on, um, as I mentioned, I was on a panel with uh, quite a few other brands this morning, and we were talking about lining up your social impact with the company values. And one thing that kept coming up was like authenticity um, and picking something and being specific about the initiatives that you're going to be working on. It's better to do a few uh, things really, really well than try to be everything to everyone when it comes to social and environmental causes. Um, so being really specific. And if you want to be a more sustainable company, um, really being selective about what that means to you, what that means to your employees, your customers, your stakeholders, as Bree mentioned, um, and really honing in on that, whether that's you want to become climate neutral certified or you're a really large company and you think the first step is just understanding the sources of your emissions so you can get to work on reducing them. Um, but tapping that and from a communications standpoint, aligning that with like the brand values of the company itself. Um, Bella and I were on a panel for um, a, like a Winter Mountain Sports um, Summit last week. And we were talking with a bunch of ski brands about like why they're so interested in climate action. And it's not only the future of their business and the future of the sport, but just the uh, future of the places that they love and that their employees love and their customers love. And that's all threatened by climate change. You know, the ski resorts are already feeling the impacts. So just kind of really thinking about any sustainability initiatives or social initiatives and understanding what those like pain points are that are being threatened and uh, crafting a strategy that aligns with that. Because again, at the end of the day, you want to be authentic in this. You don't want to just do it for, you know, solely ROI or for greenwashing. And that has really tremendous benefits um, to the bottom line of the company as well. Thank you. Yeah, I'd say from my perspective, you know, vote with your capital. So, you know, buy brands that align with what you want. Um, and when it comes to your investment, you know, invest in strategies that are looking to create positive impact or have less emissions or, you know, fund thematic, um, you know, transition strategies. Um, and if they're not offered, you know, by, you know, look at the endowment, like, you know, see what your endowment is investing in, um, you know, where your, wherever your, you know, 401k is or your capital, like see what opportunities they have and, and ask about them um, and, and force them to, you know, move the needle and start providing more options for you to try to align your capital with your values. Isabella, any thoughts, or I don't want to put you on the spot, but just didn't want to pass you either. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I think everyone's spoken beautifully. I, I think I'm good. Okay, thank you so much. 
Um, well, we're wrapping up now, and I want to just thank you profoundly on behalf of all of us who have sponsored this evening, our uh, LMU Net Impact chapter uh, and their leadership teams. Thank you so much for facilitating, hosting, and moderating the evening. To the Center for International Business Education, um, really focusing on uh, student development and, and, and business development in our global reality and in our global economy and really helping enhance global competitiveness. Uh, the, in, the Institute for Business Ethics and Sustainability, as Dr. Peck mentioned at the beginning of our evening, this conversation this evening is an introduction to a two-day event that follows, which is our International Business Ethics and Sustainability Case Competition. We have student teams from universities um, throughout the country and around the globe who are coming to make presentations about business issues and solutions that would advance positively the sustainable development goals and explaining how those are appropriate uh, legally, financially, and ethically. Um, finally, what you see on the screen, and thank you so much for doing this, Marky, is that our students at Loyola Marymount University participate in something called CBA Advantage, which is a series of programs and uh, activities and actions that they can involve themselves in over the course of their years at Loyola Marymount University, and they build an electronic portfolio. Um, Alexandra, you said at the beginning, from a career development standpoint, get involved, get recognized, become known as one who is committed to this work and has experience in the work. Uh, these kinds of tools in CBA Advantage enable students to develop that kind of portfolio. So we always end with a QR code so the students can uh, log that in and uh, enter this into that portfolio. And, um, and then if maybe we could just take that down now if we, and then put it up for a second, just as I wanna be able to close out the evening. I want to thank you so very much. It's been a great honor to have you, and we're really honored by the conversation this evening and every all of the insight, knowledge, wisdom, and, and real dedication and passion that you shared. Thank you so very much.